Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, just a reminder, and feel free to note in the chat window if you can hear me, because everything on my end looks like it's working, but kind of hard to tell if I'm talking to my computer or not. Uh, you should have on the left side of your screen of your web browser a like a cartoon bubble that is the chat window. You can use that throughout the course of the next hour, and it will broadcast chat messages to everyone. There should also be a question button over there, which is also active. And you can use that to pose specific questions that you may have as we go through. I believe the questions just come to me. Um, if you can send them to everybody, that's great. If not, it'll just come to me, and I will read the question as we go through. Um, and try and answer it, or take notes and figure out how to get back to you with an answer if it's something I can't answer on the spot. And thanks, Jim and Karen. Apparently, I can be heard, so that's uh, that is fantastic news. Insofar as this like seventeen dollar a month webinar software seems to be working, all good. So hopefully, uh, you can see a PowerPoint slide in front of you, and I will. Now I have to get a little tricky. Oops. Sorry. So uh, just wanted to cover what we're going to talk about today. So I know some of you on this call have quite a lot of um, genetic background, even formal education in some places, probably more than me in genetics. Uh, and I know that others are, um, are you know, less immersed in some of the scientific side, either um, as, a, as a hobby like myself or as professional education. So I do have a few slides at the beginning just to take us off on general terms. Um, you'll remember probably most of it from even all the way back to high school biology, but it's just to sort of set the scene because those are the important terms and concepts that then actually inform how we start to interpret the information when we get to the latter part of the, of the presentation, um, which is really actually, I'll, show, I'll go online and walk you through how to look at your optimal selection profile and talk about what some of the different sections mean, the disorders, the traits, the graphs. Um, as I mentioned, feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, but also, um, I have some time set aside at the end, if timing goes as I hope it does, um, where we could cover anything specifically at that point. OK, so now we're going to kick off with basic genetic terms. And I want to start with the super basic stuff, which is the, the terms phenotype and genotype. So phenotype, which you probably have heard a lot, it's the observable characteristics of an individual. So you can see in the picture here that I've got Callista on the left, and Callista is tawny. That's a, that's a phenotypic trait. Um, one thing to remember about phenotype, it includes behavior and working ability. So it's things you can observe, not just the morphology or the color. Um, but obviously, morphology and color are, tend to be more where the term phenotype is used because it's the most immediately apparent visually. Um, and what you'll see on the right is, is another dog. That's uh, uh, North Down Precious. Um, and Precious is a Chinook, a purebred Chinook. And as you can see, Precious, the, the things you can observe about Precious just in this picture, she is buff um, and she is an affected dwarf. Uh, you can immediately tell that by her relatively normal body size and, and quite stunted legs. Genotype is the genetic makeup of an individual, and that you cannot necessarily tell by looking at them. You might make some educated guesses. You might be right. But in fact, you can't tell genotype. It's not an observable characteristic. That's why we do things like the optimal selection test. And that's why, in some cases, we've learned some things from the optimal selection profiles that we didn't know before we started having some Chinooks um, submit for them. OK, so phenotype and genotype, because these will come up again. Next, if my slide will advance. Here we go. Um, again, really basic stuff. Chromosomes, right? So chromosomes are thread-like structures in the nucleus of a cell that contain genes. They're basically a very long strand of DNA, um, as evidenced in my new favorite chromosome picture. that has the little DNA helix floating around in it. So. Anyway, things that amuse me on uh, Google Images when I'm putting a presentation together. Um, so, so that's chromosomes. We've got genes, which are the basic unit of genetic inheritance. They're a subsection of the DNA, a piece of it, so to speak. Um, and the locus, plural loci, is where that gene sits on a particular chromosome. 
should all be pretty straightforward. I'm sure you all know this, but bear with me. Um, and then allele, because we'll be talking a lot about alleles. Alleles are one or of two or more alternate forms of a gene at a specific locus. So if you look at the picture up here, you've got three genes, the P gene, the A gene, and the B gene. Um, they're at different loci, as you can, you can see. Um, and, and the P gene right here has, has only one allele. It's homozygous for the dominant allele, which is the big, big P. Whatever this individual is, they have two, two dominant alleles. Um, here you'll see, again, the same thing, although this is a recessive allele, the little A's. Um, and then at this, this third gene locus is a heterozygous um, locus. And you'll see there's both two alleles there, the big B and the little B. Um, so just general common terminology, and, and we'll go forward with this. I'm just going to take a pause and flip back because I can't see questions or comments when I'm in the presentation. But apparently there are none, so I'll go back to the presentation. So, so now we're going to talk about how alleles act. And, and, and you, you, you know these terms, and I've, I just said them on the prior slide, but you've got heterozygous, which is when an individual has two different alleles at a particular locus, right? Maybe there's only two alleles, like the big B and the little b. Maybe there's multiple options. There might be four or five different options of alleles at a particular locus. The individual's obviously only going to have two. Um, we'll talk about when we get to color how there can be, I think the, the sable locus has at least four known alleles, and, and an individual can have, um, can have two of them, um, but might be homozygous, which is that individual might have two of the exact same alleles at that locus. So heterozygous, homozygous. And then I wanted to talk very quickly about how alleles act, because this is the really relevant stuff when we start talking about um, genetic disorders. Uh, and again, this all the way this goes all the way back to the pea plants, if you remember from uh, from your biology classes. But you know, when Mendel did his uh, his sort of mad experiments that that are the foundation of genetic theory, he did it with pea plants. And and a dominant allele is the allele that determines the phenotype that is expressed by the individual, the organism, um, even when heterozygous. So we talked about phenotype is how it looks. So the dominant allele determines how something looks for that whatever trait that allele or gene happens to control. So the example in pea plants is, if I were to take two parent pea plants, one of which is homozygous for, um, for purple, which is the, the two big R's, dominant purple, and, recess, and one parent is recessive white, all, all of the children are actually going to be purple. They're going to be heterozygous because they're going to have one allele from the purple parent that's the big R and one allele from the white parents that's the little R. But physically, if you look at these pea plants, they will be purple. They will look like this parent because the, the purple is the dominant allele. The white allele is recessive. Its expression is masked by the dominant allele. So you wouldn't know and, unless you were to genetically test this or do some test breedings and, and see what happens in its offspring you wouldn't know that this F1 generation pea plant actually carried the allele for white because it's hidden by the dominant. These are, this is the simple way that alleles act. It does get a little bit more complicated. There's a couple of other concepts. There's incomplete dominant, which is where um, two heterozygous alleles blend their traits together. So the snapdragons, and I apologize for using color analogies here because color is not the most important thing, but it is obviously visual. And so it, um, I'm hopeful that it is an easy way to explain this um, versus some of the more theoretical ways that you could do talking about affected of diseases and things like that. So incomplete dominant, if I take a red snapdragon and a white snapdragon, assuming the snapdragons are homozygous for the dominant red versus the recessive white, and they have children snapdragons. The snapdragonettes, I don't know, the, the baby ones are actually pink. They're neither red nor white because red and white are actually incomplete dominant. One allele does not completely mask the other. So let that sink in for a second. Another sort of similar, more complicated way that alleles work together is codominant, which is where both alleles express their traits. So 
instead of dominant and recessive where one wins or incomplete dominant where they blur together into something that's actually different in co-dominant both win and the example here and i didn't even know this was actually possible until i googled pictures of it in certain breeds of chicken if you breed a white chicken to a black chicken you get a checkerboard chicken that's a that's a real picture you can google it so so this checkerboard chicken is he's he's um heterozygous he's got one black allele and one white allele it looks like the checkerboard because the black and white are co-dominant for that trait. There's a very small subset of co-dominance as well. It's called overdominance, which is where the, there's actually um, an advantage to the heterozygous form. So uh, the, the example here is sickle cell disease in people where normal people are homozygous for no sickle cells. And if you're homozygous for sickle cell and you only have sickle cells, it actually is a very painful and potentially deadly disease. But if you're heterozygous for, for the sickle cell, which is this condition where you have some, you know, one normal allele and one sickle cell allemia, sickle cell allele, it actually confers um, a resistance to malaria, which is actually where you see a lot of that trait coming up. So, so overdominance is where if you were to, ha it's it's this condition because having the the dominant sickle cell form, it it homozygous is not good for you, but in fact having it in a heterozygous form is beneficial if you live in an area where malaria is endemic. Okay, I have one last bit on how alleles act, um, and so this is so we've been talking about how alleles at the same locus work, basically within a gene and the two alleles related to it. But one thing we also have to um, recognize is that alleles in a complicated way can act on each other. And epistatic is the word for that, where one gene or set of alleles actually masks the expression of another allele. And again, I've gone to color because it's, uh, it's obviously simple and visual. So I'm going to talk about uh, two genes in dog co coat colors, which are the E series and the K series. And in the E series, the dominant allele is EM, which has black masking. Um, and capital E, which is called wild type, is the, is the next most dominant. Now, it, will, it loses to the black masking allele, but it wins over the recessive red allele. So those are, those are actually in order of the dominance of the allele. Then there's a separate um, gene called the K, K series which also has three states, which is KB is the top dominant, it's dominant black. Um, KBR is brindle, which is again, recessive to dominant black, but dominant to wild type, which is KY and recessive. And so to hopefully explain this in a way that is better than what I just did, um, here's two parents. So there's a golden retriever here and a Malinois. And the golden retriever is exactly the way you think all golden retrievers look. He is um, E, E, the little E's recessive red. All golden retrievers are E, E, recessive red. And the Malinois over here, parent, is masked. So you know, uh, you know he's at least, or she is at least E, M. Um, and you can see that she is not black and she is not brindle. So it's a little dangerous without having the, the full testing on her, but it's pretty fair to assume, and we know this from Malinois testing because it's just not in the breed, that, that she is actually um, wild type. She's KYKY. She's homozygous for wild type, which is why she's not black and she's not brindle. Except when the, this dog and this dog had puppies, some of them came out brindle. And people were very confused as to how that could happen because brindle is dominant to recessive. Both parents are not brindle. You can clearly see that, but the puppies clearly are. So, you know, the first thought was, uh, did the postman come calling and stay a little bit too long? Or, in fact, this is epistatic. The, the E series masks the K series. So if you have a dog that is recessive red, it actually masks that the dog might be dominant black or brindle. And in fact, there are many golden retrievers that genetically test as carrying brindle. You just don't see it in their phenotype because the double E that all golden retrievers have masks out that they can't produce the black in their coat and they turn that lovely golden retriever color. But if you breed it, you know, if you see in golden retriever mixes, there's not an unusual number of them are actually brindle. 
Um, but that's, that's just a visual example of epistatic, where the E series in golden retrievers is frequently masking the K series. Okay, so it looks like, hopefully everybody hasn't hung up already, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, looks like there's no questions. And so what I wanna do at this point is flip over to actually showing you the optimal selection summary report so that we can talk about a little bit about, right, so you should be able to see my screen now. And what I really wanted to talk about is, you know, when you get your dog set up, there's some different areas. So this is a, this is a new dog here, so I can show you a blank profile. When you log in, let me go back. You can either click on the picture or click somewhere here. It'll go to the dog's profile. And it, you know, because this dog has not been set up, you can do the normal things. You can set the dog's name, the breed, the date of birth, gender, um, additional information if you'd like. And there's these two checkboxes, which are only there unless if you haven't previously checked them. So one is to make the dog's results and public and profile public for all users to view which I do recommend, there's no harm, there's nothing bad about what your dog's genotype is, it is just information. Um, and we, I'm really proud of the Chinook community, we have about 60 dogs that have been tested and we had, well we had 50 public profiles when um, they switched the profiles over to the new website they deliberately made a decision to make all the dogs not public again because it, they, the profiles now included new information on the MDR and DM tests. And so they didn't want um, people to find out through someone else if their dog had tested as a carrier or God forbid affected. And so when they reset the profiles to the new site, everybody's profile went back to private. Um, but what we've had subsequently is just in the first couple days of the new website, we've already got 41 of the Chinook profiles public again. So I know many of you on here have done that. I'd just like to say thank you. Um, in fact, in talking to Gina Scoper, they're a little bit stunned at, uh, at the participation and willingness to provide information and make things public in the Chinook community. They've, they've been really impressed by that, so thank you. Um, it, once you check this, by the way, it, it goes away and you can no longer, you can't uncheck it. It's just a one-time setting unless they do a major website update, uh, again, which hopefully they don't do too frequently. The other thing here is um, activating the breeder tool for your dog. So I would encourage you if your dog is intact and, and potentially uh, a dog that will be bred to do this because it enables them to show up in the breeder tool results for other Chinooks. And, and we'll talk more about that later. But you can, I mean, you basically can just check this. It'll give you this checkbox where you can write a little description of your dog and why they're the greatest Chinook ever. Um, and you're good to go. Now, then you would save changes. I'm going to cancel out of here because I've obviously put no data in, so it's not going to do anything for me. Um, one other thing, if you want to put your Chinook's picture here, basically click on the profile picture and upload photos. Don't do what I did for a while, which is click on dog photos and upload multiple photos here, which was great but doesn't actually give you the profile picture. You have to click on the profile picture here and upload a special photo here, and then you can go click on dog photos and add more photos if you'd like. Okay. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm just gonna show you the summary page. I'm gonna do Callista because she happens to be the first one in order for me. So as I, as I just showed you, when you click on them, it brings you to the summary page. Um, you'll see Obviously, you can you can all read, so I won't read it to you, but you see limited information at the top. If you click on this bar, it will bring up the extra information on the dog that you've entered. Um, there is this, if I wanted to go edit something for her, where I can click on edit profile and go back to the same screen we were just at to, to change or update any information. And there's these tags here. So you can click on tags and say, what do I want people to know about this dog? Um, and you can... Basically, at first, they'll all be down here, and then you can click on, yep, she's a working dog, and it'll come up in her tag. You can, so if she had nothing, you know, you can just pick, yep, she is a show dog, yep, she is a companion dog, yep, she's AKC registered, and pick whatever tags are relevant for your dog. This can, particularly if you're looking to breed your dog in the, in the near future, I would encourage you to do it, because in need of breeding partner is a filter that people can use in the breeder tool. So if you haven't selected it, your dog might not come up. 
um, if it is a dog that you are looking to breed in the in the you know medium term. Okay. The other things that are on this page is um, so this says her breeder tool. There's 20 matches, so they've amusingly chosen a heart. Um, you can click on this and it'll take you to the breeder tool or you can click down here and get her specific breeder tool results. Um, they'll show you different things. If I were to click here, I get the whole breeder tool, which you can see at the top, breeder tool. Um, and it shows me Callista's results, but I can also click here and I get all of, the, all of my dogs or dogs that have been shared with me. So in the breeder tool, I can move from one dog to the other more easily than if I'm just back on an individual dog's page. If I just want Callista's results, I can click here and it'll give me her breeder tool results down below. Scrolling is going very slowly for me, so I'm gonna go back to here, okay? Um, the other thing you can do here is share the dog's results with someone via email. It'll give them a link, so you would just click on this. It pops up a text box and you can you can put in someone's email address that will it will share um, the full results, including the breeder tool results. So the difference is, if you make a profile public, that dog's report is public, but the breeder tool is not. If you share a profile with someone, that dog's breeder tool information is available to the person you've shared it with. Okay. If you are move, if you want to move the dog profile, so if you've bought a kit for someone else, but you know now you want to move the profile to them for maintenance for the future. Um, you can click this button, put in their email address, and it will move their um, move the whole thing so it doesn't appear in your list anymore. It appears in someone else's. And there's also, obviously, the ability to print out a report. The other things that you start to see as you scroll down in the summary, you see the disorders, known disorders in the Chinook breed, right? And right now, many of you will probably have reports with just two of them, and that would be degenerative myelopathy and multidrug um, resistance one. Some people, and Callista happens to be one of them, for dogs that have tested as carriers of the dwarfism mutation, um, it will pop up in this short list on the summary page where it has three conditions instead of two. And as you'll, you can see here, it's noted as a new potential disorder in the breed. We'll talk more about all these conditions later, but just know that on the summary page, you're only gonna get the disorders that they feel are relevant or have been found in your breed, not not the full list of 143 or 145 things that they've tested your dog for. You'll also get some of the key traits, so some of some of the color um, and coat things will be here. But again, just to, just pick certain ones that they've cherry picked to appear on the summary page. And then if you keep scrolling down, you get the graph section, which shows you um, your dog's genetic diversity, where it plots on the so the blue line here is obviously Chinooks. The green line is currently Chinook and related breeds, um, and the orangey gold line is all dogs. So you'll see where your dog is um, on the overall spectrum, where they fit on Chinooks, and how that fits everywhere else. You'll also see over here, this is all of the Chinooks that have been tested and where they fit. So you see this is, this is Callista, um, and these are all the other Chinooks, so I can see where she sits relative to a bunch of them. And that's pretty much what you get on this summary page. I'm gonna go, gonna go back to here. Sorry, I'm learning the software. I gotta share, there we go. So we go, we go, um, right, so that's all I had on the summary page, because really the summary is just a, a subsection, subset of all of the detailed information. And what I want to talk about now is disorders, which is one of the areas of detailed information that, that you'll go into. So overall, the optimal selection test for 143 disease mutations, many of them are breed specific, like, uh, I don't know, some hypothyroidism in rat terriers or something like that. Some of them are begin uh, as a test with one breed, and then they find that those are actually becoming relevant, and they're finding those um, those mutations in other breeds. Degenerative myelopathy is like that, so you may have heard of it in reference to German Shepherds. 
Um, right now, Jana Scofer and Mars Vet believe that two disorders are completely relevant to the Shana, the degenerative myel myelopathy or DM, and the multidrug resistance or MDR1 tests. Um, as I showed you in Callista's report, they have noted chondrodysplasia or the dwarfism uh, mutation that's found in elk hounds and Karelian bear dogs. It's noted as a potential disorder in the Chinook. I can tell you this, um, that we have had an actual Chinook dwarf. So phenotypically, the Chinook is a dwarf, has come back and tested as homozygous for the mutation. So they're finalizing it on the genoscoper side, but we, they do expect to publish in the next month that this, um, this chondrodysplasia test is relevant to Chinooks and is a known disorder in the breed. And then you'll see it move from this category up to here and all of the Chinooks where it isn't displaying on your summary page because your dogs are clear of it, it will come up. It'll still note your dogs are clear, but it'll come up as a known disorder in Chinooks. We, we expect that to happen in the next three to four weeks, um, which is really, really good news because we, we have had you know a small number, but we certainly have had some Chinook dwarfs um, produced in, in the last couple of decades. And basically this is a very simple test that, that will help us make sure we don't do that again. What I do want to note is all three of these conditions, so DM, MDR1, and chondrodysplasia, they're all recessive. Talk a little bit more about some nuances there in the next few slides, but they're, they are recessive diseases. Just a reminder on recessive conditions, which is this, this thing up at the chart. So assuming we've got two heterozygous parents that, that have both the dominant allele, the clear allele, and the recessive condition allele, which is the little r. You may remember your Punnett square from, from high school biology. A dog that inherits two of the dominant alleles that do not cause the condition is called clear. A dog that inherits one dominant allele and one recessive allele that causes the condition, they're known as carriers. And obviously a dog that inherits two of the recessive alleles, that dog is affected of whatever the condition is. Okay, and this is a, just an interesting chart. If you breed two, um, two affected dogs, all the offspring will be affected. If you breed an affected to a carrier, Again, assuming it's just a simple single gene recessive condition, you'll get 50% affected, 50% carriers. If you breed two carriers, I mean, you can you can see it all play out. This is a two um, two carrier situation where you end up with you know 25% of the offspring theoretically affected, 25% clear, and 50% carriers. And then and then again, as you start to breed affected to normal or carriers to normal, you end up with no affected offspring. Yeah, I wanted to talk about breeding advice because there's some uh, there's some very strong um, examples in recent history that that we need to learn here. Which is for recessive disorders, the breeding advice is to breed carriers to clears. The goal is to avoid producing affected puppies. The goal is not to eliminate alleles from the population. We've had some instances, and I'll talk about Basenjis in a minute where the, you know, the breeders turned into villagers with pitchforks and went around and said, you know, we're, we're going to eradicate this bad, bad allele from our population entirely. And uh, unfortunately, because of this next thing, why, why don't we want to do that? Because on the surface, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea. Why don't we just not breed carriers um, at all? And then we end up with a population that has no more of that recessive dis disorder, even in a carrier status. But the problem here is that... Um, uh, genes and allele, you, you don't, they don't move in single bits. So there's a, a concept called genetic linkage where alleles that are inherited, that are close to each other on a chromosome get inherited together. So if you start to take carriers out of a, of a population, um, you're losing not only the bad gene that you don't want to carry forward again, the one that potentially causes the disease if it happens to meet up with another carrier in a, in a breeding situation, but you're also eliminating all of the diversity provided by the alleles that are linked to that allele. And you don't know how many alleles that is. It could be a lot, it might be a couple, you don't know. What we do know is um, Basenji's had a fatal condition called pyruvate kinase deficient hemolytic anemia, it was, it's bad. They came up with a genetic test for it, which is great, everybody rejoiced. Um, the genetic test demonstrated the condition was recessive. And breeders immediately stopped using all affected and all carriers of hemolytic anemia. Great news is today HA is rare in Basenjis. Basenjis are a fairly rare breed for those of you that, that don't know. Um, so the problem is in the 20 plus years since they have 
basically eradicated hemolytic anemia, but they have had two new recessive diseases, progressional retinal atrophy, which causes um, blindness effectively, and Fanconi disease, which is a very serious kidney problem. Those diseases have popped into the Basenji population and significantly increased in frequency. And so, it, and these, when they came in, uh, PRA and Fanconi disease did not have genetic tests. So what the Basenji breeders did was they took a condition for which they had a test and for which they could breed responsibly and never produce a dog affected with hemolytic anemia. And they eradicated it, but the price was, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. The price was they got two new diseases for which they didn't have a test. Now they do now, but, but it took quite a few years for them to come up with a, a a test for PRA and Fanconi. So the, the lesson to be learned here is there's no point in eradicating an allele for a recessive disorder for the population. If it's a dominant allele, that's a different discussion. If it's a recessive allele, you can have carriers, they will never have a problem. You can breed them to clear dogs, they will never produce an affected puppy. And you retain all of the potential good, good um, genes that they can offer to your population uh, at basically no cost. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the three conditions that are known in the breed. So degenerative myelopathy, it's, it is a recessive trait. It's found in many breeds, including GSDs and boxers. There's pictures over here. So the corgi is, um, has advanced DM. It is a progressive disease. The really good news is apparently it does not cause pain. The dogs don't have pain, but they do. Whoops, thanks, that was Nashira who decided to advance slides for you. No, not helping, still not helping. Okay, back to DM. Um, it starts off as, I think this is probably a GSD, but you can see here, um, it starts off as mild nerve loss in the rear feet where they don't, the dogs don't realize that their foot is flipped over. And it progresses to, um, to actual per paralysis of the hind limbs. So it's, it's a significant neurological issue resulting in degeneration of the spinal cord. It is a recessive trait, but it does have incomplete penetrance. So that basically means not necessarily every dog that tests with two of the recessive alleles will be clinically affected in its lifetime. Some dogs with DM um, start to be affected as early as, I mean, it can be six-year-olds, seven. I talked to somebody that had a German Shepherd who that, that basically lost control of their hind limbs by seven. In some dogs, it doesn't present until, you know, 12, 13, 14. So the age of onset can be very varied. Potentially, some dogs that are carriers might, or that, that are affected might even die of other things before um, their DM kicks in. So incomplete penetrance means you don't always see it at the time anyway in a dog that tests for it. But it is a significant condition. The people at Genoscope are noted as a disorder in all breeds. Um, I did ask them the specific question to the best of my knowledge, and they're triple checking, but we don't believe we have identified any known Chinook carriers or affected dogs yet. But because they see prevalence um, across all dogs, it is going to be listed as a known disorder in Chinooks. We do certainly have some Chinooks that have, have exhibited symptoms. Now they have all, the ones I'm aware of have tested and come back as, uh, as clear of the DM gene, but we should be aware that there's something out there in Chinooks that mimics DM to a certain extent that we see occasionally. Uh, and it's entirely possible that we might find some Chinook carriers are affected at some point. And again, the breeding advice here is to breed carriers to clears. And this is even from the OFA website. Um, you, you can read the text, but the o, even on the OFA website, it basically is saying, don't eliminate all dogs that test as affected or carriers of DM. Be it, it could be devastating to your breed. Because uh, it uh, could eliminate a number of dogs um, that would otherwise contribute really good good qualities to the breed and also genetic diversity. But DM is something that you should take really seriously. This is not a mild condition. It is it is a significant impact, and ultimately, it will cause dogs um, to generally be put down, and and has really difficult consequences on the owners. But again, the good news is no Chinook carriers are affected that I'm aware of based on those profiles that are public, but we could see it. It's common in GSDs. We're genetically close to GSDs. Wouldn't surprise me if it popped up. Now, the next trait that I wanted to go through is chondrodysplasia or dwarfism. 
This is also a recessive trait. It is found in Norwegian elk hounds and Karelian bear dogs, this specific mutation for dwarfism. So I probably should say there are several other mutations for dwarfism. Labradors have one that doesn't cause stunted limb or uh, twisted limbs, just stunted. Uh, Labradors also have a different type of dwarfism. I think there's three types of dwarfisms just in Labradors, one of which comes uh, exclusively with cataracts. So there's a bunch of different dwarfism conditions out there. This particular one found in Norwegian elk hounds and Karelian bear dogs and Chinooks uh, doesn't seem to come with any deleterious side effects. It's just, it is other than the, the stunted limbs. Um, the interesting thing is in Karelian bear dogs, when they found it, they were able to trace it back to a single sire. And that sire was widely believed to have a Norwegian elk hound parent. So until, the, until it popped up in Chinooks, the scientists thought that this was purely a Norwegian elk hound issue and that Norwegian elk hounds had given it to Karelian bear dogs. Um, they're kind of interested in where we think it might have come from in Chinooks. Uh, because to the best of our knowledge, we don't have any Norwegian elk hound in the breed. Uh, you could argue it goes back to Chinook's mother, who was a uh, a Greenland Husky, which genetically is should be pretty close to a Norwegian elk hound 100 years ago. But uh, but that might be a bit of a stretch. Maybe there's a second spontaneous mutation. Maybe there's a Norwegian elk hound um, in the woodpile somewhere. Don't know. Uh, one thing to note on this, and, and I know Maria Summer always wants to make sure that people are aware of this, it does have an impact on quality of life. It can cause um, early onset of arthritis and things like that. But overall, compared to something like degenerative myelopathy, it's a, it's a mild impact. And that's how, um, how Mars Vet rates it. It's rated as a mild quality of life impact. Um, right now, 9% of the current public sample population is a carrier. Um, or affected. We know of one affected individual that volunteered to send their dog sample in, so thanks very much to them. Um, and then we've, we've actually identified a number of, uh, of carriers. Um, these are pedigrees where we would expect, based on where we've seen some of the affected dogs pop up, that we would expect uh, to see some carriers. So in fact, the, uh, the test appears quite valid for Chinooks. And the breeding advice is to breed carriers to clear. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The third um, condition, and this is something that, to my knowledge, until these tests became public a couple of weeks ago, we were not aware of MDR1 in the Chinook. Um, but it actually has come up, as you can see at the bottom here, I'll jump to the, the payoff line here, 15% of the current sample population um, is a carrier of MDR1. So. Now, it's not necessarily a representative sample population, so that, that could, it could be that maybe it's only 10% of Chinook's total, maybe it's 20, I don't know. But of the 41 dogs that have public profiles right now, 50% of them are carriers. Um, this is a recessive trait. Uh, some of the breeds, so in um, Aussies, they definitely call it incomplete dominance, so their advice for carriers is to avoid some of the affected drugs or be careful as well, not just for affected dogs. Um, the, the good news about this is it, as long as you avoid giving the dog those, um, those medications that are triggered by it, there are, no si there, there are no effects of having this mutation. So you do wanna know if your dog's affected, because you want to make sure you're not going to ever give them kaopectate, you're never going to warm them with ivermectin um, or use some of the cancer drugs. Uh, if the dog is a carrier, technically they should be okay. Um, but some of it, I just was looking at some of the other herding breeds out there, and some of them advise not to not to give those kinds of medications to carriers as well. Um, I've got on the right, as you can see, many many herding breeds have this, and it can be significant proportions of the population. I mean, long-haired whippet, now that's a small population to begin with, but 65% of them, 70% of collies, 50% um, of Aussies, so it's, uh, it's out there. Um, and as I've noted, it causes side effects or strong reactions to certain drugs. The, the, the one thing you want to be aware of is it, it, if they get a significantly strong dosage of those medications, it can cause very serious injury or potentially death. Now that's very rare, um, but that's what takes this condition from minorly annoying to something that we at least want to track. And again, breeding advice is to breed affected or carriers to clears. Over time, that should reduce the incidence uh, of it in the population.
Okay, let me just double check where. Yeah. So what I want to do now is take you into the disorder section of the optimal selection report and show you what that looks like. All right, so we're back at poor Callista's profile. Uh, whoops. And uh, as you can see, I'm on the summary page. One thing to note here is you get some information about the disorders on the summary page, the type, the mode of inheritance, and the result for the dog, right? If you actually click on the disorders tab, you get more information. So I've clicked on the disorders tab right here, just to show you, here's the profile. We were there, we're now here. And as you can see, you come down, you actually get a little bit more information on, um, on the condition. So first of all, you can click on it. It'll pull up a pop-up window that tells you about, about the condition as well as some scientific articles, which is always interesting if you uh, can't sleep at night and are looking for some reading material. Um, it tells you obviously your dog's result, what the actual genotype is, the severity of the condition. So that's where, you know, DM is a considerable severity, dwarfism is mild, MDR1 is moderate. That's, that's the rating that's given by, um, by MarsVet and Genoscoper. It'll also tell you the prevalence. prevalence. So this was kind of surprising to me. 10%, um, 10.5% 10 of all the dogs tested do test as a uh, carrier or affected by DM, which is actually a really high percentage. We don't currently have any within breed uh, percentages. You have to have 100 dogs for that. So we're about 60 Chinooks, although I know there's a bunch pending. Um, when we get to 100, it'll start telling us what the percentage of, of these uh, mutations are in the Chinook, which would be really interesting to see. And then I don't have to manually calculate it by pulling up everybody's profile. Um, so you'll see, again, in the disorders, you'll see the known disorders in the breed. This one will be a known disorder in the breed in the next month. If your dog is a carrier, so the result's clear, it just says clear. If it's carrier, it gives you a little yellow flag and says carrier. Um, and you can see her genotype is C and T, so she's heterozygous here. Um, if it is affected, it gives you a little red flag and, and would say affected. Now, what it does say is 140 additional disease mutations were tested. There are no findings for this dog. If I'm curious, you can click on show results for all tested disorders, and I can scroll through all of them. Hemophilia B in the loss of OPSO, good news, Callista doesn't have it. So if you're, if you're curious, what, what I've done is actually check some things in here that I was curious as to whether Chinooks might have, um, like what are the Labrador forms of dwarfism, for example. Um, but overall, there's no need to scroll through here. Just be aware that it is there if you're ever interested. Um, and then there's some recommended reading and why were these disorders tested? Well, frankly, some of it is well, if they hadn't tested Chinooks for MDR1 mutation, we might not know that 15% of them are carriers. So, you know, if you're in a big breed, you know, lots of lots of the Labradors and Goldens of the world are paying for specific genetic tests. In a rare breed like the Chinook, we can take advantage of that and, and run our dogs through it to see if there's anything that we can learn from what has been found in other breeds. Okay. Now, I'm going to go back. I'm just going to check and see if there's any questions that I've missed. Uh, yes, there are. So, MDR1 and Chinook seizures. Uh, so, yes, what we do know is several of the dogs that have tested as carriers are clear on MDR1. Um, and I do know a dog that has had two seizure-like or proximal dyskinesia episodes that is clear. Um, that doesn't mean that MDR1 is unrelated to Chinook seizures. I do have a theory that it is related, but it's obviously just a theory of mine right now. So I think we don't know is the answer. There's certainly a possibility because seizures are a common side presentation of the MDR1 mutation. What happens is a dog that's sensitive to one of the medications, it can take a little bit of it and then and then at some point, it gets enough of that drug in its system, call it ivermectin, because we know that's one. It might take two milligrams of ivermectin and be fine. It might take the third and be okay. 
but then you give it the fourth milligram of ivermectin and it overwhelms it's a it does affect the neurological system in the dog that is uh, that carries the mutation um, and so seizures are quite a common presentation of a dog that ha that is affected with the MDR1 mutation and is given the medication that it is sensitive to I do not think it is the only cause of Chinook seizures though because we do have some examples already of dogs that we think are affected that don't um, that don't appear to be having the MDR1 mutation. So I don't I don't know if that answered the question. Um, I, but it's the, it's the best information we have. It is it is a nugget that we should continue to pursue. Um, in fact, I'm trying to work with people that I know have dogs that have had events, either seizures, or proximal dyskinesias, or whatever, to have them tested. Um, so that we can start to build more information about how what the genetic status is of those dogs that have had uh, that have had events, um, and I'm just trying to see that. is the prevalence in the breed percent affected or carriers plus affected? That is a great question and one that I don't know the answer to. So I will ask them. My guess is that the prevalence in the breed is carriers plus affected because that would make sense to me, but I will ask that question um, of the vets and I will get back to the people in this seminar and let you know what they tell me. Okay. So moving on to the next, the second section is traits. Um, and so I wanted to talk about traits a little bit and the we've we've talked about the e locus there's there's a couple of um, alleles or genes that are relevant for Chinooks which is the e locus and the a locus those control all of the colors that we know of in Chinooks right now um, the test does also check the K S and B lo loci but what we have seen thus far is K S and B Chinooks are all testing the same so all Chinooks have tested as um, wild type for K, so no brindle or dominant black. All Chinooks have tested is um, dominant S, so no piebald or white markings. Now, I should say the the white spotting locus is for piebald dogs, excessive white. It's not for the Irish white that we see in Chinooks sometimes with the scarves um, or sometimes the snips on the muzzle, the white paws. That's that's a different gene that there isn't a test for. Um, but for a dog like a, like a Brittany Spaniel or something like that, that's what this S locus is for. All Chinooks are testing as not piebald, um, and all Chinooks have tested as uh, res no Chinooks have tested as as recessive B. So there's no brown or liver Chinooks that have been tested. And there's been a theory for a long time that we're fixed at dominant B, which I think is true in the breed. Um, there has been talk about the D locus, the, the locus, the um, the dilute test, and that test is pending. So that's what will actually give you gray and tan versus black and tan or dilute tawny versus regular tawny. Um, they've gotten all the information the last time I talked to Heidi. And so I, I don't know if they'll be able to give us results for free. Would be great if they, they would. Um, but they do think at least they've been able to map that dilute, that D-locus for Schnucks. So the, the two that are relevant are E and A. And... Um, we have had Chinooks test for all of these potential alleles. So we have in the E locus, there's three known alleles, the EM for masking, E is the neutral, big E is the neutral one, and little E is recessive red, which is what our buff dogs are. Buff dogs are homozygous recessive red. And the A locus, we've had dogs test for all of these. Um, AY is tawny or sable, other breeds call it sable. Um, AW is agouti or wolf gray which is what you see in some German Shepherds and a lot of Malamutes and Siberian Huskies. Um, we've had Chinooks test as tan point, which is also called black and tan. Tan point is the sort of official color name for it. Uh, and we have had some Chinooks test for recessive black as well. Um, so, and these are in order of dominance. So Sable is the most dominant allele here, followed by Agouti, followed by tan point, followed by recessive black. Just to give you a couple examples before we dive into results, um, I have here Callista, who is, we would call her Tawny. She, she would have what we call a partial mask. Genetically, she has the EM allele, so she should have a full mask according to genetics. Um, 
the masking thing is a little incomplete at this point. There's probably some other alleles that, or other genes that act with the E locus to impact the extent of the mask. But Callista, Callista does have the, the mask. She does carry recessive red, so the little E, she could, um, and she carries AY, which is tawny, and AT, which is tan point. So um, she does carry recessive red and tan point and could produce buff, tawny, and tan point puppies. She can never produce a recessive black puppy because she doesn't have an A locus. So even if she's bred to a dog that carries recessive black, her AY and AT will always be recessive black in a puppy. The puppies will not be recessive black. Jedi here is, uh, is tan point, black and tan, and he is EM, so he's got a mask, which you can't tell, obviously, because he's black and tan. Um, and Biggie, wild type, so he, he doesn't carry recessive red, and um, he is homozygous for tan point, ATAT. So he could produce, this is where it gets weird, he could produce tawny or tan point puppies, depending on who he's bred to. He can never produce a recessive red puppy because his EM or E will always override the little E, and he cannot produce a recessive black puppy because he doesn't carry the little A. So hopefully that's a little clear. What I will say is just like the masking thing isn't quite exactly 100%. Here's another example of a beautiful black and tan Chinook. Phenotypically, you would look at him and you would say that dog is black and tan. His genotype is actually AWAW, which is Agouti or wolf gray, which is not pretty much what anyone would have expected. Now he does have banded hair, but most sables actually, most every dog in the sable series has banded hairs at some point. So just when you think it all makes sense, some things pop up that aren't quite the same way that you, or as clear as you'd like to be. And agouti and tan point testing is apparently a challenge for all northern breeds. Malamutes um, that look black and tan test AW as well. So I've been talking to a Malamute breeder about that. Just in terms of Chinook uh, trait summary thus far, all Chinooks have tested as not carrying furnishings or improper coats, which I think is mostly Portuguese water dogs anyway, so it's not a surprise that we don't have any. Um, we have had several Chinooks that test with both standard coat lengths, um, which is short and long. So we, we actually do have, um, this is an incorrect slide, long carriers are higher than expected. There's actually a higher, number, higher percentage of dogs that carry long coat than I expected um, when I first started looking through it. Uh, and this test does not capture the unique Chinook long coat mutation. So we know that um, that we have had a Chinook that tested as short coated, except he's clearly not short coated. What he has is a is a different mutation at the at the coat length gene, um, and that one's not tested for. But we do have several Chinooks that test for the normal or the more common short and long um, coat mutation. So there's at least three alleles there: standard short, standard long, and Chinook long. Um, but the test doesn't look at Chinook Lawn yet. And we have had one dog that came out as a carrier for Curly Coat, but uh, we're having that retested because both parents came out as not having a Curly Coat. And so either it's a spontaneous mutation, which is possible, um, or it's just an anomalous test result that we need to update. I do want a real... Oh, yeah, morphology. Sorry, forgot about that. Before I flip over to the um, to the page... I wanted to say, in the morphology section, all Chinooks have tested as homozygous dominant or not phenotypically affected for bobtail, um, short skull length, or tiny size. So they, you know, basically, we don't have any of that in our breed. Um, ear genotypes are all over the place compared to phenotypes. So I have a dog, my Takani, who has very big, very floppy ears, is genetically got prick ears. So... You can't necessarily, there's clearly some other genes that are affecting ear expression rather than just the one that's being tested. Um, and then an interesting thing here is that some Chinooks are testing as heterozygous for large body mass, which is pretty interesting. Homozygous for large body mass is common in Great Danes, Newfoundlands, etc. So, you know, sort of our freighting kind of Chinooks maybe. Heterozygous um, is common in Border Collies, Shelties, Corgis. So, um, this is just an interesting one that I'm trying to explore a bit more because I would have thought all Chinooks would have come up as large, as homozygous large, and, and they're not. So that being said, I'm going to come back to the optimal selection report and just show you what it looks like online. 
So once again, we're here. You can, you can come into the profile and it'll start at summary. You click on traits. It gives you the three things we've just talked about, coat color, coat type, and morphology. They've got a pretty slick chart that walks you through uh, the, the epistatic genes in color, right? We talked about um, epistatic genes before, but the E locus, the extensions, is, impacts this, which can impact this, which can then, then these all modify that. So, you know, they give you a little bit of a chart here, and then you come down, scroll down to results. You can click on learn more about this trait. It'll give you a pop-up box about what this should look like, a, do a dog with this genotype should look like. Um, and you can keep scrolling down, K, it shows you all of the genes, okay? And if you scroll back up, click on coat type, and it'll show you the same thing for improper coat in the Portuguese water dog. Um, coat length are fluffy in Welsh Corgi. And this is where I'm saying many Chinooks are coming out uh, homozygous with short coat here. Some are coming out heterozygous uh, with long. Um, and some dogs with long coat are coming out looking like they're genetically short. So there's there's something a little wonky here in Chinooks that we have to explore with the long long coated um, allele. And curly coat um, is the other thing that comes out here. And then morphology is the third one. So you can click here. Once you've clicked on traits, you get these three options, and it'll take you through all of the um, different morphology points. And the last thing I was really going to go through here, I think, is uh, just because I'm running short on time, is uh, is graphs. So again, you click on graphs. We talked about this a little bit. Um, what you can do is it'll show you your dog's genetic diversity. I'll talk in a minute about how that's determined. Um, I can show, if I have other dogs within the breed, I can show them on the chart and it'll pop them up as little circles. And if I have dogs that are shared to me, I can pop them up on the chart too. Or I can take them off and just see my dog. Um, I can also choose what this green line is. Right now it's Chinook and related breeds and it lists them here. So Belgian Shepherds, Border Collies, uh, German Shepherds, Leonbergers, et cetera. Um, but there's also a separate group which is Nordic Sled Dogs and related breeds. And I, if I click here, it gets rid of this in the graph and it, the green line now represents the genetic diversity of these breeds, Malamute, um, Eskies, Canadian Eskimo dogs, et cetera. Okay? So that's just some stuff you can play around with. And this is, um, let me take these off because it's a little wonky. This is the scatter plot of the Chinook. So every Chinook that has been tested is on here. And this sort of plots them genetically close to each other or further away from each other, depending on how similar their genotypes are. Again, I can click here to see all of the all of my dogs added, and I can click here, and it will add dogs that are shared to me. Or if I just want to see where my dog is, I can do that. If I if I do this as an example, it I can. Well, I used to be able to. Yeah. So I know the big circle is Callista because that's whose profile I'm on. But I can hover over here and see. This is Nashira. Of course, I'm not. This is Sakari. This is Takani. So you can hover over it and see. Um, again, down here, I can select Chinook and related breeds, and I can see. Okay, then I can hover over Chinook. They're down here. So here's my Chinooks. Uh, it doesn't look like we're that close, but keep in mind this is a 3D graph. So depending on what angle you take the, they take the picture at, it looks different. But then I can hover over all of these different breeds, and it will highlight them on the right if you look over here as I hover. So I can say, wait, where were the rough collies? Okay, there's the rough collies. Oh, they're quite close to border collies. There's the German Shepherds. Look at that one German Shepherd hanging out in the middle for some reason. There's the Tamascan dogs, and there's my Chinooks again. And then I can go back to just seeing the Chinooks, or I can come down here and add the other Nordic breeds and see all of their things. I'm going to overrun by probably five minutes. Sorry, guys. If you need to need to go, I totally get that. Um, what I do want to do is come back here and just give you a summary of what we've seen in the uh, in the graphs. So hopefully. 
hopefully you can see this. One of the things that's, um, that you see there is the genetic health index, which is a number. And Chinooks tend to be in the, uh, you know, 90 to 100 range. There's some a little bit below and some a little bit above. Um, I, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that the GHI is not stable. So as more dogs are added to the database, it can change because it's set around an average diversity being 100. And so as more dogs get in, if they're less diverse, your dog's genetic health index may increase. If dogs get added that are more diverse, your genetic health index might decrease, okay? You don't want to use it solely for breeding selections. A dog with a low GHI might not be the best match for a dog with a high GHI because they might be closely related to each other. So you really want to use the breeder tool for breeding decisions. This is just to give you a little bit of a thumbnail. The other thing to be aware of, it does not take into account inherited diseases for which there are no tests. So for many of the things affecting Chinooks, some of, some of the seizure disorders, hip dysplasia, some of the cataracts or other eye issues, some of the allergies and GI issues that we're having, there are no genetic tests for that. And that unfortunately means that the, the genetic health index can't incorporate them. It can only incorporate the data that it has. So it is a useful piece of information, but you should in no way put overwhelming emphasis on it. It is, it is something that is useful to know in conjunction with a lot of health history, a lot of pedigree information, and even some coefficient of inbreeding information. And so that sort of leads me into genetic diversity. So the sample size, as you can see in the graphs, is about 60 Chinooks. The diversity calculations, and this is straight from Genoscoper, it uses about 2,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, I did want to get into what a SNP is here, because it, it, you can think of it as a a single, a smallest unit of an allele, potentially. Um, and it, it includes the, the two, about 2,000 SNPs that they use include some risk areas like the major histocompatibility complex, which impacts um, how strong an immune system is. So it's, a, it, it's certainly not testing every single allele your dog carries, but it is doing a pretty decent broad scan using some of the um, most recent genetic testing science that they have today with the SNPs. Um, as you can see, the median diversity of breeds, you know, Chinooks right now are sitting at 28.1. Um, uh, you, can, you can easily see the, the other breeds up here. I put, you know, German Shepherd, Border Collies, Legatos, Barbets, and Tamascans are pretty rare breeds if you don't know about them. Um, they're all doing better than, the, better than we are, frankly. What I don't know is Tamascans and Barbets both have crossbreeding programs. And so I've starred these because those diversity numbers may include um, some crosses. What I've done over here is just said, you know, the Chinook and putative related breeds category, um, all of the breeds average there have an average diversity of about 32.1, so we're lower. So we're German Shepherds, but we're quite a bit lower. Um, and Nordic Sledge Dogs as a category, their diversity is about 33.2. We're, again, quite a bit lower. Um, sheep Dogs as a category are 34, and all dogs are 34.8%. So um, unfortunately, in almost all of the comparisons I was making, we did we fared the worst in terms of genetic diversity as a breed, even compared to some other relatively rare breeds with low numbers like ours. Just something to think about. And so before I go to any questions, I wanted to go back. I'm going to share the screen. Back to the report to just show you one last time. Again, all of that diversity information, you know, you can see here. Um, so right here, it tells you the median for all dogs, Nordic Sledge breeds, and you know, so these numbers will change as dogs get added, but you can certainly see um, we're in the 30 to 100 tested dogs category and, and we're at 28.1. I'm not going to go into the breeder tool here because that is a subject of a future webinar, but I just wanted to let people know that it is here, um, and it does tell you some information. You can click on it, and, and just like the genetic health index, I just want to be really clear that this is an important piece of information. It should not be, um, at this point, it's, it's still a little theoretical, so we're learning lots of things from it, but it's um, even with some times where we have both parents tested and some children, the results are um, not necessarily as clear-cut as you'd think. 
So I think it's important and, and useful and can help guide breeding decisions, but you should never use it as an overwhelming criteria. There's lots of other pieces of information that should be incorporated in any breeding decisions. And so I'm not seeing any questions. Let me go back to, oh, sorry. I missed the chat stuff. So um, if the dwarfism section does not show up on your profile, your dog was tested for it, but your dog is clear of it. So if you were to click on the area that tells you all of your, um, if you want to go through all of the results, the 141 or whatever tests, um, you will go in there and you will be able to see that the uh, that your dog is clear of dwarfism. It's only the carriers where the dwarfism pops up in the summary. Um, if your dog is clear for everything, why is he rated? What? Why is the genetic health index what it is? So, the genetic health index. It measures the heterozygosity, so it goes back to back to these about 2,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms it's looking at, and it's saying across all of them, how many of them are heterozygous and how, how many are homozygous. And it says the more of them that are heterozygous, the higher number you're going to get. And so those, per, those three particular mutations, DM, MDR1, and dwarfism, it's three, it's three loci of, you know, I forget how many tens of thousands of alleles or genes there are in, an, in a dog. So the diversity test is actually looking across many more, a much broader subset of your dog's DNA. And it's saying across that broad scan, you know, this dog is more heterozygous than, than, than average or less heterozygous than average. It might not have the, one of those three specific mutations, but it says that in other areas, a dog may, may have more um, homozygosity than another dog. And in general, um, you know, the science demonstrates that heterozygosity is, is the advantage. But the other thing I'll say is that, again, genetic health index is something that can change as we get more dogs in. What it is telling us is we don't have a lot of Chinooks that are over 100. I think we have two. So... That's not the greatest thing in the world for us. Um, ideally, we would have more than that, and we don't. So genetic, and, and you can see from our genetic diversity numbers that you know our diversity is lower compared to other breeds and compared to other categories. And so um, if, if diversity changes, if we can maximize the diversity that we have, um, then you're in better shape. Uh, and if you can add genetic diversity, then you can improve some scores for dogs in the future. Uh, and so I just wanted to leave that there. Going back to questions, if genotype shows as dash dash for tested disorder, that typically it should say no call or you should be able to click on it and go in and it'll say that the dog tested as clear. Sometimes, just because of the, the nature of a cheek swab sample, the, the sample gets degraded where they're trying to test for something. And if it says no call, and I think that dash dash might mean no call, that typically means they don't know or they weren't able to get a result for that test. Doesn't mean the dog's affected or a carrier, just means that they couldn't, they couldn't test it with the sample that they had. Okay, if it said result clear, but gene dash dash, it's the result you're, you carry about. So the result is clear, he doesn't carry, the dog doesn't carry any of the, any of the mutations. So go by the result clear. It just means that they might not have a name for the mutation. But clear is what you're looking for to have a clear result. Okay, I'm sensitive to that we've, we've overrun by a bit, so my deepest apologies for that, but I'm happy to take additional questions if there are any. Let me go back to the... Okay, there were no additional questions. Okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize there were lots of questions coming that I wasn't answering because of my inability to use this. What might one use as an alternative to ivermectin? Um, the, there are alternatives out there. I don't know what they are, so I would recommend talking to your vet about that. Um, 
because I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, you could certainly look through Google and, and your vet can certainly um, tell you what information there is. But I do know that collies and whatnot do have heartworm medication, just doesn't have ivermectin on it. Um, were there piebald Chinooks in the past? Uh, I'd have to go back to Chinook and his family uh, and look. My guess is some of the initial offspring of Chinook, I, I'm actually not aware of any piebald, but th there might have been. I've certainly never seen any photos or documentary evidence of um, Ch Chinooks that were actually piebald in the past. Uh, AW Chinooks, I'd have to look that up. Off the top of my head, I think it was four or five that I've seen. So four or five out of 50, 10%. The finished dots uh, are the two samples that we sent in for the uh, dwarfism validation. So because they didn't come in the normal way, they were, they were done you know, for free via Genoscoper, those dots show up as finished Chinooks. They're not actually Chinooks from Finland. They're Chinook samples that went to Finland, um, and that's why they look a little anomalous. In terms of what Chinooks should participate, so at this point, I would highly recommend if you have a dog that you want to breed, that you participate in it, as, particularly if you have a stud and you want to make people aware of how he might complement some of the females out there, it would be fantastic to get him in because the breeder tool, which, which I'll talk about in a different webinar, but it actually matches your boy up to a bunch of the girls and says, these are the ones we think might be really good matches. And then you can, you can start to explore that. Um, at this point with a 15% carrier rate of MDR1, any dog, which is almost any dog that has had a um, neurological event or has close relatives with a neurological event, I would recommend, or any dog that's close pedigree wise to a dog that has tested as MDR1 carrier, I would recommend because it is, I think it's something you would want to know, something you want to tell your vet. Um, how important is COI with this information? So I'll talk more about that in the breeder tool discussion. Um, I, I think COI is still complementary with this. Um, COI is almost like a, it's directional. It's going to give you something in the right direction. Um, and then this test can actually narrow down. For example, if you're considering two siblings, and you want to know which one is going to be the better match, you can actually use the breeder tool here to tell you which one of the two siblings is the most diverse match for your girl. Because I've seen sibling results that can be as much as 10% apart on uh, diversity, or 10 points apart on the genetic health index, which is probably more like, well, I don't know, 4 or 5% apart from a diversity standpoint. But, but you still, it doesn't replace COI. I think it goes along with COI, at least until we learn more about how the breeder tool is working for us. Okay. Um, and then there was a question about, do we just need more dogs? I, I don't know if that's related to diverse, uh, to the test or to diversity. I mean, it, right now, our diversity is low, and certainly the recommendations from the population geneticist would be to both work on maximizing the diversity within the breed and to add diversity to the breed. So um, that's, that's just the population geneticist input. We're in the process of getting a new update on the Chinook Pedigree Project and linking that with this information, which should give us, um, give us a, some broader information. Um, what population should be sampled? I think I covered that, and I think it was re-asked because I just had totally skipped. There were questions here. Um, but if that's still a question, feel free to ask again, and I can try and answer it in a different way that might be more helpful. Um, is it possible to have a black and tan that has parents of AYAT and AYAW? Yes, it is. This is... Um, so AY again is tawny. So if I have a parent that's tawny but carries tan point and another parent that's tawny but carries wolf gray, can I get a black and tan puppy out of that? That's what we've actually seen in a few places. And it's related to the fact that the AW or wolf gray and tan point or AT, somehow genetically their testing is the same in northern breeds. It's the same problem that we're seeing in um, uh, Malmutes, that the, the test doesn't, does seem to be a little wonky with AW and AT. My guess is that the AW dog is actually AT, but you know they, they, we need to do a bit of research with them to figure out what the problem is. Um, 
the clusters on the map are these siblings. So not necessarily. Um, if you can, if you go through the public profiles and map names to dogs, which I've done, at least for the dogs that were public at the time, some even of the overlapping circles aren't necessarily siblings. So you, you can tend to see siblings concentrate in a certain area, but a dog might actually be very close to a dog genetically that is not its full sibling. And that's what we've seen in the results. And yeah, more dogs in the study. So yes, I mean, at this point, um, at this point, again, I would recommend anyone with a breeding dog to put it in. I, I don't think it's a requirement. You're not necessarily negligent if you don't, but you're going to get useful information if you do. Um, and if you do have a stud that you would like someone to use, this is going to be a good way to start getting people to be aware of the attributes of your stud and, and what he might be able to bring to a breeding um, in a different way than, than some of the other stuff. Um, and in addition, again, particularly with the MDR1 mutation, I would also recommend any dog that has any degenerative myelopathy symptoms or dogs related to dogs that have um, had high den paralysis that they've aged. They would be good ones to run through to see if there's if they truly are any carriers of the gene. Um, and then those closer related to any dogs with MDR1 or dogs that have had neurological events or dogs that are at risk of uh, dwarfism via pedigree. So we sort of know where that's come from in recent years and dogs that are related to them should be tested. Uh, it's funny, somebody asked me just the other day if we could take DNA samples from semen um, for a dog that's deceased, and I will ask, I don't know the answer to that, if they can run this sort of profile on a deceased dog, but, but it's certainly a question that I will ask and get back to you on, uh, on what, the, what Gina Scoper says. So that being said, it looks like um, it looks like there's no more questions at this time. So I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for participating in the pilot. And I greatly apologize for running over by a significant amount of time. So that's something I need to work on for the next time. Um, we, we are going to be setting up a seminar specifically on the breeder tool where we'll talk about um, how that's an input to a breeding decision, how it relates to COI. Uh, and then we've also been asked for webinars on disorders that we don't have genetic tests for um, but what, what do we know about them and what don't we know? And particularly cryptorchidism and seizures cropped up there, um, as well as additional on genetic diversity. So uh, I will, there, there will be stuff in um, per perhaps an upcoming schedule in the CQ or certainly on the COA webpage. And I will share that to some of the Chinook groups on um, Facebook as we get these things scheduled. It's just a matter of trying to figure out some, some times to get out there that people might be available. The other thing I would ask is um, if you have any feedback on what worked and what didn't work in this, I would really appreciate it. You can send it to me or you can send it to anyone on the COA board um, because this, this again, was the first time we tried to run one of these and, and would love to get any feedback on what we could do to make them better in the future. So thank you. Thank you for your questions. And at that point, I'm just checking... We still don't have any new questions, so I will let you go. Thank you for your time, and have a great rest of your weekend.